so keep it, keep it moving. Um, my name is Matthias von Gutenberg. I'm a member of Free State Project. I was here in 2013. Well, uh, I finance one of the places. Uh, but I wanted to talk to you guys today about why I think the future of liberty is going to take a different direction than we are accustomed to. And I think that there's a lot of different strategies for liberty that people attempt and they gravitate to or they enjoy. Um, so for some people, it's just pure politics, I guess. But you know, I'm interested in, in things like agorism and interested in things like peaceful parenting, things like homeschooling, things like alternative currencies, different ways to kind of um, undermine the state, different ways to promote liberty. And I think all of the different strategies that are attempted, like education, like getting out and convincing people and getting the leaflets and all the, you know, if only they have enough books by, by Lawrence Reed, then they'll know that, you know, inflation is bad, things like that. Um, I kind of lost a lot of faith in that. I lost, I lost a lot of faith in trying to convince people. I lost a lot of faith in trying to vote for people or get the political attraction going. Um, and what got me excited was the idea of gaining liberty through cryptography, um, through computer science, through obfuscation. And the promise, I guess, or the benefit, or the, the, the goal of crypto anarchy uh, is to create an anarchy not by changing the rules, not by convincing people that the rules shouldn't be followed, not by raising people who don't believe in these rules so in two generations we can have liberty. It's to defy the rules and to do so in such a way that you can't be personally identified, you can't be held personally accountable for it, they can't find you or, and, or, or uncover your messages or uncover your communications. And that's, um, that's a different way of thinking about how to achieve liberty. It's more of like kind of just grab it by the balls, I guess, and, and kind of ask for permission almost. Um, but what, what, what I like, and I started getting into computer science, and I started getting into Bitcoin as an entryway into this, and I started reading some of the history of the cypherpunk movement, some of the cryptographers in the 90s trying to develop digital cash systems, they were trying to develop internet communities that were private, that were voluntary, that were opt-in, that were secret from other people that were trying to, trying to watch. And digital cash was always kind of um, difficult to be done. You, know, you could communicate privately over encrypted channels. Uh, you could have, you know, you could, you, you could meet and you could send data and so forth, but sending value across the internet, sending value in a peer-to-peer -peer way that didn't involve touching either Visa or PayPal or Amex or the central bank or the government, or something like that. Um, uh, it's been not possible really until the last couple of years uh, with, with Bitcoin coming out. But I think that it represents such a fundamentally different way of, uh, of viewing the problem and viewing the solution to the problem. Um, so, you know, I, was, I used to be a very much like end the Fed kind of guy. You know, I studied Austrian economics for years. Um, so, you know, Ron Paul and, and Von Mises and Rothbard and these things, and I understand what the government did to our money and so forth. And I, oh my gosh, we have to go back to a uh, gold standard. We have to go back to some kind of independent commodity-based standard or something like that. But you know, that really just kind of gives, puts it back into the government's hands. They're like you manage it, but according to these rules, please. Um, and so eventually, when I discovered Bitcoin and I discovered the kind of uh, crypto ecosystem that exists, it, it was no longer end the Fed. Now it was just ignore the Fed. Now it's just let's just use this money. Let's not use this money. And it'll kind of fall of its own weight, like a like a massive colossus. I mean, remove the pedestal and just kind of falls in shadows. Uh, and so, to me, the idea of achieving liberty through through cryptography is really exciting because I can have an impact. I don't have to have 500 people behind me. I don't have to have an army. I don't have to convince the multitudes. I don't have to convince the unwashed masses. I can communicate with my friend Robert here over an encrypted end-to-end -end secure session that would take more computing power than is possible to get millions of years to break the encryption cipher. And, no, and so therefore, it prevents anybody from eavesdropping. It prevents anyone from tampering with the message. So encryption provides uh, confidentiality, provides authentication, it provides data integrity, if you want to know that stuff. Uh, but what's exciting is that that creates little pockets of anarchy. If I can communicate with a couple people, and nobody can read those messages except for us, Nobody has any idea what we're talking about or transacting in, what kind of arrangements we've made. We meet in secret and we talk about these things. It grows and it includes more people and it, 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 it introduces blind spots. It introduces um, situations in which authorities are going dark, or they're going blind, or they can't 
they can't, they, they can't uh, surveil interactions and transactions. And when that begins to pick up, and people are using things like Bitcoin to, ex to exchange value more or less anonymously, more or less pseudonymously, when they're using things like Text Secure, or they're using PGP over their email, or they're using these various tools uh, that are able to obfuscate, like, say, your IP address, using Tor or something like that. There's various tools you can use um, in your online interactions that will grant you substantially more freedom. And it's not more freedom because the laws got overturned and we're marching in front of the courthouse on a victory parade. It's not because we've raised a bunch of angels and cherubs and they're going to install the you know the perfect society or anything like that. It's because they literally technologically are incapable. The regulations can't be applied because they are incapable of being applied. They can't. You can't do know your customer. You can't follow know your customer regulations. Well, you can if you if you kind of change it to Frankenstein. But with with Bitcoin in a pure Bitcoin environment, it's very difficult to enforce anti-money laundering laws because you have no idea who the parties are. You have no idea what's being transacted. You have no idea where that income came from. And so, any ability to enforce these regulations, to enforce these like, well, John Smith did this and he traded this. He's for ten years. He has paid this kind of fine. It's completely dark. They have no idea the amount of resources needed to investigate people that use encryption or people that uh, bounce their IP address, people that even take very basic steps to improve their security. All right. Um, so, like when I, you know, when I'm home, I don't like to use Windows. I have to because I like to play video games. And Linux is not a very good environment for that. But small steps that you can take will substantially increase your freedom. And the point of this is to create. Intentional communities, you know, what we're doing here in the Free State Project is an intentional community, right? We're trying to geographically locate for freedom. Uh, the point of adopting these tools is to create a society or to create an environment in which the rules that we hate, that, that, that lock us down, that chain us, that steal our money, that steal our children, things like that, that they can't be enforced anymore. Because parties can't be identified. Because money can't be tracked. Because, you know, the various communications that people have that are logged on my phone or logged in, you know, Verizon's ISP, you know, database, whatever, that's either encrypted or it's denied to them. And so, to render the government a completely blind spot, I really should think the mic can be heard, but nobody's going to hear you later. <laughs> Good point. surveillance very difficult and very costly and in so doing you uh, protect yourself you insulate yourself a little bit from the kind of all-seeing eye and when there's a critical mass of people using these tools or using these applications or protecting themselves in these ways it creates um, network effects it creates smaller and smaller com small communities that grow into larger communities and we can create these little archipelagos of anarchy on the internet. You know, ten people are using encryption and they're chatting in this and that way. And oh, okay, that's fine. But the point is that by by making these, you create anarchy in the real world. So I'm not just talking about cyberspace. I'm not just talking about internet freedom, although that is the strategy that ties into the strategy. The point is to render the government permanently forbidden and completely unnecessary. The point is to take the services that they provide that are valuable and recreate them on decentralized grounds, on peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks, on applications that are protected, that are secure, that, do not, you know, that don't leak information, that don't give away your identity. And there's already so many different applications that are being recreated and reworked in this kind of crypto-anarchist direction. Uh, we look at applications and things coming up like Open Bazaar. Open Bazaar is a software application that you can download and run as a client on your computer, and it connects you to a worldwide decentralized ex a marketplace. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a marketplace where people buy and sell goods and services, and they use cryptocurrencies as the medium of exchange. This application, first of all, couldn't be possible without Bitcoin. 
and, and it runs, it, it's, it's a similar architecture to something like BitTorrent. So if some of you are familiar with BitTorrent or how it works, it's a decentralized kind of file sharing protocol. Um, you know, the Pirate Bay gets taken down in Sweden, and two weeks later they're operating in Costa Rica again, the servers are back up. Uh, it's this type of architecture, it's this type of enterprise that governments are incapable of attacking. So we kind of, if, if, if you go back a little bit in history, we start to see uh, things like Napster. And Napster was a great attempt at sharing files, at sharing music between you know, parties that were willing. You know, I, I don't believe personally in intellectual property, so I'm more than willing to take part in file sharing applications and programs like that. But it had very weak, it had a lot of weaknesses. It was centralized, all the data was centralized, geographically was centralized, and they got sued and they got raided and they got shut the hell down, right? And years later, there were more iterations, right? There was LimeWire that came out, and there were various other applications that came out that, 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 did, that, that, that weren't susceptible in the same ways as their predecessors, uh, but they were susceptible in other ways, right? Maybe so the, the management was centralized. So if you just target the CEO, if you target the people in front, then they'll, then they'll shut the whole thing down or whatever. There were still points of failure. But what ended up happening was this architecture is robust and it's anti-fragile. It doesn't respond to stressors by shattering. It responds to stressors by evolving. And so what's happened in the file sh with file sharing technologies, for instance, is that they've evolved to be uh, they evolved to be to become immune, essentially, to the typical tools governments use. And that's not by open combat. That's not by petitioning. That's not by whatever. It's by building technology that doesn't have a single point of failure. It's by building protocols, by building technology that enables people around the world to communicate with no regard to what some bureaucrat and their local, you know, palatial city hall, whatever, had to say about it. Um, and so there are similar analogies in different applications. So the history of digital cash goes back to the 90s, things like e with things like eGold and DigiCash and HashCash and B-Money and various different kind of iterations. Uh, if, if, you, if, you, if you learn about Bitcoin, if you um, understand kind of the technical underpinnings of how it works, and you go back and you read these like attempts in the 90s to do, you see, oh, that's, that's kind of cute, but here's where they here's where they failed. Or you know, here's an interesting problem, you know, with this, whatever, but it, they, it evolved along similar lines. And so, of course, Bitcoin will continue to evolve. It's open source. Maybe there'll be some iteration in the future. Uh, but the point is that it represents success at achieving this type of secure digital money. And this is, this is huge. This is enormous. We can trade labor over the internet now. We can trade value. We can buy and sell to each other using secure media, using secure communications, using money that not very plausibly can be tracked back to you, right? So, so Bitcoin operates on pseudonyms. It's not perfectly anonymous. Um, but there's various ways to continue to strengthen your security, to obfuscate yourself from the authorities. And I think that this strategy is highly effective and I think that it is effective without requiring huge numbers. See, that's one of the big problems, in my opinion, with various different strategies. If you're trying to be successful with politics, you need to convince a lot of people. You need to, you need to have, you have armies, you need to have manpower, you need to have candidates and volunteers and money and all these things to try to move these you know, unwashed masses. The, the rubes that are just kind of voting just by their instinct almost. And, and, and by educating as well, you know, hand, you know, teaching people about inflation or teaching them about business cycles or the minimum wage or teaching them about how the state, you know, ruins, uh, you know, disenfranchised people, blacks and so forth, and how the state does this and that, you know. You could educate people, you know, I'm a product of education. I became a libertarian anarchist through becoming educated and learning these concepts. So it can happen and I encourage it, but it's so labor intensive. It's so time intensive. And I just think that that is a long way to go about doing it. Because when you give people the tools to evade state authority and state surveillance, it doesn't matter whether they know why they work. It doesn't matter if they care about how they work. It doesn't matter if they're ideologically invested in how it works or whatever. It doesn't matter. They don't need to be educated. They just need to know that by using this, I get to keep more of my money. Or by using, by using this, I don't have my messages read. I don't have my data taken from me. I don't have this whole dossier that's being built 
you know, in some kind of awful NSA lab about me and my life and all of the second by second, minute by minute details, right? And so I began to be kind of disillusioned with education, disillusioned with politics, and so, you know, now I encourage people to take an interest in crypto programs. I encourage people to take an interest in learning about this direction for liberty. Learn about the steps that you can personally take. Now, and I understand it's very deep. Nobody wants to dive into the deep end of you know, to, to, you know, compiling Tor and this obscure Linux distribution, all this weird stuff. But you can you can take very baby steps. You can take very small steps and become more and more acquainted. Become more and more secure. Right? Even if that's just switching from Google to Start Page. Even if that's just chatting over Tech Secure instead of the default I am you know text message app you have on your phone. Whatever. Very small things, taking a look at Linux instead of Windows, for instance. But more than that, you don't all need to be level 20 techies to make this work, right? I, 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 I speak on these issues, and I write on these issues, and I explore, and I discover on my own about these issues, but you know, I'm originally an economist. I'm originally a social sciences guy. I am not you know, a Cisco certified engineer. I am not a you know, very elaborate tech head. But everyone can play a part and advancing these ideas and advancing the narrative that, in the first place, government is not an institution that we should be asking permission from. It's not an institution that fundamentally cares about us or represents us in any significant way. It's an institution to be avoided. It's an institution to be um, undermined. It's an institution that, in my opinion, should not exist and should never have existed. And so I want, I want nothing to do with it. Um, I don't want to get into the politics side of it. I'll be giving a talk on that at some other time. It's a little bit less safe for work. But at this point, I guess I just, I just want to encourage people to look outside of these typical paradigms. How do I make change? Well, let's, let's jump on this political program and take part of this thing. And I kind of, want to, kind of want to stop you from doing that a little bit. I want to necessarily, I don't want to disillusion you entirely, perhaps, but I want you to open your mind to the possibility that we don't even need to play by these rules anymore. The technology exists where we have a choice. The technology exists where we can effectively obscure ourselves from that, create little pockets of freedom amongst ourselves, and use that to propel us into freedom in the real world. When the state can't surveil people's information, when it can't identify transactions, when it can't tax you, because all the transactions are on cryptocurrency ledgers. They're not in fiat or credit cards anymore, whatever. When that situation emerges, the state in, in my opinion, will just kind of shrink and collapse like a black hole, It'll just kind of, and it's gone. Right? There's, there's no money. They can't afford to hire, the, the, to retain the bureaucrats and the public officials. They can't afford to dump more resources into trying to break the encryption that these new activists are trying to use. With. Denying them the resources is a very important part of crypto anarchy because it's removing yourself from that nexus and just kind of letting it fall. And it's building the alternative institutions at the same time. You know, we're, here in New Hampshire in the Free State Project, we're building networks of Bitcoin users. We're building networks of crypto users. We want to get people interested in their own security and their own data. And by taking interest and in doing this online, we're able, to, um, we're able to catapult that into reality. And I think that that's an effective way that we can go about undermining the state and finding liberty in our lifetime. I used to think that achieving liberty was a multi-generational project. I used to think that there's never, uh, there's, not near, there's not a way that I'm going to convince enough people or that we're going to convince enough people that the Federal Reserve causes these unending business cycles and they steal from 90% of the people to give to less than 1% of the people. There's no way that we're going to convince all these people of all these ills that, that the state does, and, and we all kind of understand this. So I used to think that, okay, well, that's just our lot. You know, we're, we're just freedom fighters, and this is the goal, and however long it takes, that's what it's going to take, but this is the way we do it. And now, to me, after coming into this perspective, to me, liberty is a sub-generational project. I believe I can achieve liberty in my lifetime, because I, do, I believe the state's weapons are outdated, are inefficient, they don't work against the new peer-to-peer -peer technological architecture that's being that's emerging. And I believe that we can get rid of the state or or, or isolate it or live outside of it, however that's going to play out within 
a generation. Not my grandkids, not their kids, but me and my kids. Uh, and that's why I like to speak to this. I think it's much more inspiring than resigning yourself to like, well, a hundred years, our kids, kids, kids will be true, true blue anarchists, and they'll, and they'll, you know, and they'll build it, they'll do it. This now puts the onus back on us because we have the tools, because we have the capability, and you know, when you are fighting for something like your own freedom, you want to adopt the best strategy to do so. So I think that it only, I think that it behooves everyone here in this room and everyone here that's at Liberty Forum to start looking into secure applications, to start looking into crypto anarchy as a perspective for freedom. And uh, just the way that I speak, I probably end up going a little bit in circles. So I think I've said enough. I'll stop there and I'll open it up for questions right now. Thank you. Do their, do their part, they're not going to fight, you know, open combat with the police or anything 
that, but, but they, they, they try to do what they can to be there for you and to give you resources during those confrontational moments. Um, and I guess I don't really have a good application to point to, say, ah, here's the, here's the free market firm that the millionaire is going to want to use. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're just starting to see the kind of the beginnings and the formulations of that. You know, what does it look like when defense becomes local and decentralized? Well, if you did answer the question, I just wanted to say that maybe it's a lot of little things. Uh, like I use Startpage and I've looked at Bitcoin and I've done barter and yeah. just kind of use your head and don't show more ostentatious wealth than you can justify from your paper income. Right, but you're right, it does It does separate, make a wedge. It does make kind of like my real legal identity and then, you know, myself, me and my wealth, what I own, is going to be different than the white market government reported earnings that I'm going to be, you know, writing. Uh, so they, they will be different and it will force you to, to this kind of like neo Mr. Anderson kind of a, kind of a weird role. Um, but, you know, eventually one will just displace the other. You know, eventually as one, the, econ the economy of the crypto ecosystem continues to grow and the state economy continues to fall, you know, taxes are not being generated, revenues aren't being generated, one will just end up displacing the other and then the state will just be kind of pushed off the map, off the table, I guess, so to speak. Are there any other comments or any other, any other questions? Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for showing up. I appreciate it.